whatever it's the whatever, why is. Whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, those are those are good reasons why. So this right here, we need to go ahead and pray. Yes. We haven't prayed. So let's just, you know, one time look at the Lord. So Lord Jesus, we come before thank you. First Lord. of all, I'll give you praise, glory, and honor. We thank, thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to come before your people, Lord God, to share with them, you know, financial literacy, some tools, you, some things and skills that we have learned, Lord God, that we can pass on to them so that they can implement in their life to be more productive, more active, Lord God, and feel better about themselves financially, Lord. So we yes. just ask that you make it simple and simplistic, make it plain, Lord God, so that way everybody can utilize these fundamental tools that we're going to give them to be the better for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Okay. That's nice. So with this being said, we did a mm. poll. How many income streams? So everybody's familiar with what an income stream, right? That's common you know, terminology, right? You want to have what multiple income streams, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, how many do you think that you should have? And this is income that is in addition to your job. So this is additional, like I always call it, multiple streams of income Correct. or additional stream of income. Like what else? Your um, job or your main base would be your one, right? Yes. And yeah. anything that you do in addition to that to generate or earn money would be your next income stream. Okay, I see a four to seven. Oh, okay. I don't know if I got that much in me though. Seven. I see Cheryl says. <laughs> hey, I love it. Okay, I love it. I love it. Sister Janetta was saying that she does commercial real estate, um, residential cleaning, Absolutely. notary. Awesome. License, notary, fingerprinting. Yeah, <laughs> travel okay. agency. Okay, you see Aslan yeah. on here with the bacon. We had some of her cake a couple weeks ago, yes. so we know that that's good. Oh, I love it. Holistic wellness and fitness. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. At least three. It looks like yeah, the three. majority are coming with three. three. We have Dewana, who's um, Jamaican. <laughs> no, no offense to no Jamaicans. With the five, um, she probably really have seven. At yeah. least two. That's my girl. That's right. you know, that's my girl because I I can only do so much. Y'all, I love y'all though, but I can only do so much. <laughs> books and more books. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> So, okay, so yeah. we have a pretty good response on the poll. So obviously um, the there's, average there's, number is there's about no magic three. number, but about yeah. three, three to four, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, streams of income, because what happens is if one of the wells, quote unquote, dries up, that you still have something else to continue to take care of the lifestyle that mm -hmm. you're accustomed to living, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So like you can Wendell wear multiple said, hats. However much you can handle. You can handle. Absolutely. Because you want to be great at them good all, answer. right? Yes. You don't want to have a whole bunch of things to do. And then you feel like you're just running around in circles and you, you're sick and broke down because you're just doing. So find the thing, right? Or the things and, and do those well. Okay, I guess I can read it. Gig economy. So I know that word is thrown out a lot. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know what that meant. I'm just going to be honest, right? Um, it's a segment of the service economy based on flexible, temporary, or freelance jobs. I saw the word gig and was thinking tech. I'm just gonna be honest. Okay. Well, a lot um, of people think gig and would still come up. Like if you're like a musician and you and, and you're doing a gig, a gig. Yeah. yeah. So that's why that's why I mean yeah. that I didn't know exactly, but this is the actual definition. Yeah. Often involving connecting clients and customers through an online platform. So that's where I got the tech part because yeah. I just saw online platform. Oh, this must mean gig dealing with the tech world. Okay. But it's actually anything that you do. Um, that's on the side. That's, that's on not, the side. That's not a permanent. And, and Clint doesn't like the word hustle, so I will try not to say hustle tonight, right? Yeah. Because hustle, there's a negative connotation that comes with that. I don't see it as that, but I get it, right? So you don't want to be out there saying, that's I got a right. side hustle, because then people think you're hustling them. And we are fans of the show American Greed, and yeah, they're always hustling. So <laughs> I see why he doesn't like yeah. using that word. So that's the definition of gig economy. And here's a little video for you to help explain it. Yes. The word gig usually conjures visions of a one-off musical performance. It happens once and then the band is off to find their next performance, or gig. Gig is actually a slang term, meaning a job for a specified period of time. 
but it's found its way into mainstream business vocabularies as more and more communities trend toward a gig economy. A gig economy is a free market system in which temporary positions are common. Freelancers, independent contractors, project-based workers, and temporary hires all fall under the title gig workers and are found across every industry. Gig employees could be writers, rideshare drivers, photographers, accountants, realtors, handymen, programmers, tutors, artists, dog walkers, really anyone who enters into formal agreements with a company to provide services without being on the company's payroll. With digitization, the workforce is increasingly mobile, so workers can select temporary jobs from around the world and employers can find the best individuals for each job, without as much geographic constraint. The gig economy also saves businesses resources, like benefits, office space, and training, while providing employees benefits, like an improved work-life balance and freedom to select jobs, or gigs, that they're interested in. While this flexibility is appealing, gig workers in turn usually trade that in for modest pay, little or no health or retirement benefits, tax complications, and out-of-pocket equipment expenses. And there's a blurred line between those who voluntarily work as contractors and those who are being taken advantage of by an employer that might classify someone as a contractor to get out of paying fair wages and benefits. All right, so hopefully everybody is kind of familiar with what we're going to talk about. And now we got to figure out or find what your gig is, right? Yeah. We already... We've already talked about you should have about three to four. Yeah. yeah. So this is the why, right? Why do people need to get a side business or side income or multiple streams of income, mm -hmm. right? The overwhelming majority is you need to make extra money on the side just to maintain your standard living, right? Mm -hmm. 55%, yeah. you know, 22% is the only way they make money. So some people only are a entrepreneur. They may, you know, do real estate. They may do insurance. They may, you know, drive Uber. They may just be a, you know, musician as that is as a gig, mm -hmm. you know, to do it, you know, for their everything, right? You know, 48%, you know, used to balance their, their careers and their family needs. So they need to make extra money to put food on the table, you know, some do it to, to, to make money while they're in transition, getting a better job. And yeah. then a lot of people like it for the autonomy and the control. Mm -hmm. You want to not be told when to go to work and how long to be there. You know, you don't want to work for a boss. You know, one of the things that somebody told me a long time ago mm -hmm. when I was feeling a little disgruntled with my employment situation, they said, when you become to be annoyed, it's time to be self-employed. <laughs> Other than I that, I think I heard that one. You just, always coming just, up with something. Just, just, just work the job and show up. Yeah, somebody old told you that. Um, yeah, so <laughs> this always points out the why. Um, yeah. I do a lot of side businesses, um, only a few at a time, because our full-time gig for me, Clint has a his still has his real estate and insurance and tax firm that he's still um, doing and does that all the time. I would say full-time, yeah. everything you do is full-time. Um, and then I am, of course, with the restaurant part of us, which is the wing stops, um, Fat Burger, those are being um, handled and ran very well um, by partners. And then we have the handles that are now under construction. So both handles are currently under construct under construction and we'll be opening um, one in August um, and one in September-ish. Um, we're still waiting for those confirmed dates. But one thing I've learned, I think from you, just being with you for so long, right, like 27 years, um, is having the side business. Um, I can even go back and I didn't realize and I wasn't calling it a gig back then. I was just calling it working at the mall for some extra Christmas money, right? Okay. Yep. <laughs> that was my why when I worked another, at LA County, right? And I worked at, you know, at Bullock's actually. Um, if y'all remember the name of that store, I just aged myself. But Bullock's um, is where I worked. And I worked there because I wanted Christmas money and clothes at a discount. That, that was my why. I'm just well, being honest, right? That's a why. That's a why. Um, but as I got older and found out things that I wanted to do, then it became more intentional right. because now I was more intentional about the moves that I was making, 
Um, once we did the work and I did the, got into it and, and dived into it and said, we got to get out of this financial mess that we're in, um, more so, you know, marrying each other and marrying our debt, um, we had to climb out of that. And so I started falling in love with side businesses. What's funny is a lot of times it was just helping out a girlfriend. Right. who was Avon, right? Or who was Mary Kay and she needed me to sign up. So I'm like, yeah, I'll sign up for, with it. Um, so I've always been introduced to side gig, you know, side jobs. Um, but most recently I've taken it to another level, right? Um, I think we can go to the next slide since we have the top reason. Um, but I've taken it to another level. When it was something that I wanted to do and we'll do the poll right after I finish, when it was something I really wanted to do. For example, we got intentional about our savings, right? right. We always said, oh, let's make sure that we have um, money saved up before we take a trip. I don't wanna show the paparazzi. Now listen, y'all, y'all done seen the paparazzi slide. So we are gonna go back some. I ain't saying you gotta sign up for paparazzi, okay? Let me just make that disclaimer. I'm just giving an example because we're gonna talk about MLMs. So if we can go back. Y'all pray for Sister Yanni because she over there in the jungle, meaning in the deserts of the internet and that internet thing be over there tripping. Uh, <laughs> I love her though, so I can talk about it. But that's why I discovered multi-level um, multi marketing. Yeah. So multi-level marketing is when you have, it's not to be confused with a pyramid scheme because I know that everybody associates MLMs with pyramid schemes. It's really not. There are really ones, those Legit out there legitimate, legitimate that are legitimate marketing. As that you can really I'm, make money. A product. I mean, I got yeah. my start and I got my license oh, that's for, good. Yeah. for my uh, insurance businesses, uh, uh, my uh, licenses for investments. I have three security licenses that allows me to uh, trade stocks and bonds, future funds, uh, insurance license through uh, A.O. Williams and Prime America, which is a multi-level marketing business. You know, I didn't uh, uh, continue my career there. I was a regional vice president for uh, several years and I did seven years with them and I left to do my own form, uh, my own uh, uh, firm. But that was where I got my start. Mm -hmm. So it's a great introduction without having the cost, which mm -hmm. we're going to show a little bit later of uh, running a brick and mortar business or right, a right. Uh, more traditional business. So that way you can find out if there's something you can do because you will have to put in the old four letter word that we don't want to talk about work, W-O-R-K. So no matter what you do, you're going to have to put in the work. So that was just uh, an opportunity to get involved in something that you can do on the side through multi-level marketing. So we're talking about different things. You know, obviously there was gig, you know, what you could do. Uh, and actually later on in the slides, well, we're not getting ahead of ourselves. There's other opportunities uh, to talk. So yeah. I think this poll is, I don't know what this one is. Let's, let's post let's, it. Let's allow it to pop up. All right, because we were talking about gig economy. That's why I said we got a little bit too okay. ahead of ourselves. Oh, okay. So which gig economy have you done? You know, was it Uber, Lyft, Postmates, DoorDash? You know, Amazon, you know, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, drop shipping and things like that with Amazon. So these are uh, easy, uh, accessible ways to get involved in uh, the gig economy. And I don't know that people knew because we talked about gig. If they knew that these were considered these fall under that, they fall under the gig economy. So, oh, I see a lot of people have done Uber. Yeah, that's good. It's the, uh, that's good. One of the most popular. You know, Amazon flags. Okay, we have someone coming in there. So we'll just leave that up for a few more minutes. And so these are all side gig businesses that you may have done, or you know someone that has done it, or you've been interested in thinking about doing it. Let me tell you something about these Ubers and these Lyfts and the Postmates. During the pandemic, my kids were killing it with Postmates, right? They had the app, yeah. they had it mapped out they had it timed out um and they made a lot of money more doing postman more than hundred dollars a day because remember that was a pandemic so everyone was eating at home because you weren't allowed to go into the restaurants so that's when that thing took over it took over it took over um and from there lyft came about postmates i don't really see wow 
So we have more people that have done Uber and Amazon flex. Okay. Right. Don't sleep on the other ones though. Don't yeah. sleep on the other ones. No, those have, those are there. That have, have done Talk about well. your client that does Uber. Yeah. I mean, it's making about 70 to $80,000 a, a year. A year. You know, year. Doing, uh, a year. Doing Uber. I mean, very diligent. And, and works it as a quote unquote job. Yeah, he works so, it as his full time so job. He, yeah. He, you know, says, okay, I'm going to work. And he turns his little thing on and says, I'm available to uh to uh to go out on the road. And uh, you know, I I I do his uh financials. So over uh the last, I mean, I think he's been doing it for more than five years, mm -hmm. and he's averaging sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't don't think that you can't. When I was in the insurance business under multi level market, I made six figures. So, uh, so gig economy is a little different. It is different than multi level marketing can still be a gig, your mm -hmm. side gig. Mm -hmm. We're just showing you the different way. It depends on how you want right? to do it. Right? It just depends why. on what, how I you mean, want to do it. Yeah. If you need to make extra money and you need to make extra $500 a month, then that's how hard you work it. And mm -hmm. they can it can produce for you. If you want it as your main stream of income, like we had a few people that can do it then some of them can go ahead and to venture into that. So it just depends on what your why is and why you're working it. If you see it as you want autonomy, you don't want to punch a clock. So you need to go out there and work it hard. Then you need to go ahead and put in the work and the time that it takes. And if it materializes for you, you know, I just know personally myself, my clients, some of these uh, uh, areas that we're talking about, you can do quite well, yes. quite, quite well and support yourself <laughs> yes. financially. Yes. So it just depends on what works for you. Something doesn't work for everybody. That's and why I, we wanted to bring multiple. And we're not promoting any one thing. We're seeing what works for you and figure out how to help your own budget. If mm -hmm. you need to make extra money to save, if you need to make extra money. And then you can see how much time you need to vote in order to make that happen. And, and I think that's part of it, that it's important that you do know why you're doing it, um, because that will be your motivation. When you get tired and you don't want to go out again or you don't want to make that call, um, especially when you're looking at um, MLMs, a lot of time it is based on you also building a team, right? That your why as to why you're doing it keeps you motivated to get up. It's You really can do well as an entrepreneur, but I remember you told me this a long time ago. Being an entrepreneur is the only business that you're going to do. You work 80 hours yeah. a week to avoid no. working yeah. 40 hours for someone else. The only job that you're going to give 80 hours a if week you're be successful. to work for yourself, right? To avoid yeah. working yeah. 40 hours for someone else, right? Yeah, 100 hours. You're, 100 always, <laughs> you're always working. You're basically. always working. No, we're going to get you some sleep and we're going to make you take breaks. So it's okay. <laughs> Right. But that's that's the thing that entrepreneurism I'm finding out, because remember, I'm coming from L.A. County um, when Clint and I got together. He was already in the insurance and already an entrepreneur. Uh, when we first met in early college years at church, you worked at Bank of America. No. Who did you work for? Security, Where? Pacific. Security Pacific. Right. Um, and then from there, I, you went from that to insurance and you never looked back. That's what I remember you doing. Um, so but you got to work hard. And this man works hard. I was very comfortable with my nine to five, 15th and the 30th paycheck. Don't play with me about that. Um, and then also being able to do something on the side if I needed to and when I needed to. What I found myself, and we talked about in the first week about budgeting, and it's not a bad word, okay? It's not a bad word, but because I didn't learn the game and the art um, and be intentional about my budgeting, I found myself in so much financial debt, credit card debt. We talked about that already to where now doing these side businesses helped. It helped me get out of debt. It helped me pay off some bills. Like if right now you know that you want to pay something off, um, this is a great time to get a side business. Um, if you like to bake, I know someone in the comments, um, Sister Aslan says she's a baker. She does amazing, right? I'm always asking her, okay, so how's your business going, right? Um, you, you ready to do it, you know, to the next level? What, what are we doing? Um, Sister Cheryl is on here. She does balloons and parties. You, do is you, you know, to always make sure that you account for your time and your labor. Yes. A lot of people, yes. unfortunately, in their, in their why and their 
cost of goods or their price points, they don't include their personal time that you're taking to do it. So then you get frustrated when you're not making the money that mm -hmm. you want to make. Always think about you're the time. baking the, the cookie and then you're selling it for the price. So maybe the cost of your ingredients was, you know, 50 cents a cookie and then you're, you're selling it for a dollar. But you put it in seventy five cents worth of time, you know, in that cookie. So now you're your at cookie 20, is not price you're, right. You're sis. at a 25, 25 cent loss on your cookie. So yeah, you're, you're going to be frustrated. So you have to be confident enough about your business and your value to make sure that you include your price and then maybe price at two dollars. So now you have a profit. So no plug. That's one of the things that we talk about in my niece's book, which is the 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 lemonade stand. Yes, she yes. talks about you know, cost of goods, you're keeping your receipts, learning your, your numbers, because that's one of the key things that I find that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that do those type of uh, uh, businesses, mm -hmm. baking, catering, things like that, they don't account for their time. Yeah, and they get so frustrated. Um, so just to give you this, this slide is up and it's just showing a MLM. We use that as go back, go back, go back. Yeah, um, we're using that as just an example, right? I am a producer in paparazzi because y'all know I don't play, I play to win. Um, but I've done Avon before. I've done uh, Mary Kay before. Um, I did LuLaRoe, right? LuLaRoe was very fun um, for me. That's when I was selling the clothing. Um, it just took over my house and I, I, I just couldn't do it. I have to have a brick and mortar for clothes, right? But it was, it was a good lucrative business. And then along the way, my why became helping others because I would get calls all the time. How do I start a business? I wanna do my own business. What do I need to do? How do I get a wing stop? Oh, okay, let's go down. Cause wing stop is on another level, right? McDonald's is on another level. Chick-fil-A is on another level, but these are other businesses that people are doing and doing them very well. Um, one thing I loved about, I love about paparazzi and LuLaRoe that I found out that whether I built a team or not, I'm still able to make money because yeah. I'm looking cute. So I might get off of here and go sell some jewelry tonight on Facebook, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? But it was one of those things that I love the product. And so I said, let me do this on the side because I love fashion. My yeah. why, right? Yeah. If you're going to do a side about. business, make sure that it's something, something that you're passionate, passionate about. So then you will feel committed to it and you will continue to do it even when you don't feel like it. Because it's your passion, right? Absolutely. It's your passion. And I also tell people, if you want to do MLM or you want to get into business, a side business, and you want that to take over and retire you from your nine to five, make sure that that business is thriving. Make sure that you have some money set up and saved up because everything has a slow time. All right? Everything has a downtime and a slow time. So you want to make sure that before you take that leap, it may have done good at Christmas time because everybody was shopping, but then spring come around. Now you don't quit your good county job and you're trying to do this side business and spring is their low season or slow season. And you find yourself dreading it and having to go back to the job, right? So just do everything decently and in order. And, and we even help clients, you know, that come on to that side of it. No when to um, transition. No when to transition is important, but don't sleep on the legitimate multi-level marketing businesses. There are a lot out there. Those are some of the ones that I've mentioned that I actually love. Um, like I said, I currently still do paparazzi. I still have a team um, under me for that. And I thought it was a great business and it's doing well for me. Let me tell you something. Anytime your side business, we're going to talk numbers for a minute because I feel like I need to tell this to somebody. When you can make $1,500, $1,000 a week, doing something that you're passionate about on the side, why would you not do that? Especially if you're in the hole. I had a person on my team that signed up under me and she was in tax trouble. Yeah. She had a tax problem. She started working this business and within six months, she was out of that tax debt. So sometimes your why is just to get you out of debt. People talk about, oh, D, we see you and Clint traveling a lot. When we know we're traveling, even with Wingstop handles and fat burgers, we still map out every move that we make. We look to see what it is. If it's if I know I want to go shopping while I'm on that trip and I don't want to necessarily take from my household money, right? Guess what I do? I go and get my side business 
and I got some money. So now when Clint was like, now what you trying to get? You don't need nothing else. I could say, ho, ho, don't do me. I got my little side money over here and I'm gonna pull from that account. And the other side that it has blessed me with is the philanthropic, the philanthropic side. I have been able to bless girls that are in foster care with toiletries and, and gift bags, um, scholarships, because I've done a side business. So that becomes my why now, right? That I'm helping people. I'm, I'm on my way to, to coaching them and to getting out of financial debt. And then they find something that they love doing. And then we even had, I had women on my team that their young daughters were being introduced to entrepreneurism yeah. Yeah. because I have mother and daughter teams. Yeah. So that's a whole thing. I could talk about MLM all night. We're just giving you some ideas just in case you're in a valley of decision about what it is to do and side business. Tax wise, there's benefits also. Come on, tax. You know, to have a side business because now you can use it to offset that W 2 income as well. But you do have to make sure that you stay compliant. So this is a news flash from the IRS. <laughs> so because we're doing everything here right yeah, and legitimate. That's right. So that's here you right. Go. Here you Play go. the video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel, and I work for the Internal Revenue Service. So, your sister turned her social media passion into a paying gig, creating social media sites for local businesses. Meanwhile, your best friends are using their cars for a few hours to pick up passengers and make some extra money. And your neighbor's kids are away at college, so they rent their spare rooms out to travelers. What do they all have in common? They're participating in the sharing economy also called the gig, on-demand, or access economy. With the help of online platforms or mobile apps, people find short-term jobs covering a wide variety of skills, and more and more people use their cars and their spare time to pick up passengers or rent their spare rooms out. If you use your car or house through a mobile app or online platform, or you find jobs that way, you need to keep in mind the tax implications. The IRS has set up special information to help you navigate your tax responsibilities in these emerging areas. Keep in mind, if you receive income from a sharing economy activity, it's generally taxable. On the other hand, some of your business expenses may be deductible. So if you've joined the sharing economy, head over to the Sharing Economy Tax Center at irs.gov to see what tax issues may affect you. For instance, should you pay estimated taxes? Are you an employee or independent contractor? And what forms do you need to file? Know the tax rules so you're ready come tax time. Learn more at irs.gov slash sharing economy. So once again, it has a lot of benefits. Yes, there is uh, uh, tax that you have to pay or set aside on the income that you make, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, but paying taxes is a good thing. I always tell all my clients that don't worry about paying taxes or making money because fortunately we don't live in a dictatorship, right? Where they take all your money, right, you know, right. they take a percentage of your money. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. don't limit yourself on how much money you can make. Just make sure that your paperwork and your books are straight. Yeah. So that way you don't get yourself in the hole and then digging yourself out the hole. That's when it becomes where you say, oh, the IRS and everything like that. See, that's not a problem. I want to make money and I don't mind paying your fair share because I know the more that I, I make, the, the, the better off I'm going to be. I'm not going to have to give them dollar for dollar. Normally, mm -hmm. it's only maybe 25%, quarter percent. So why should I limit myself on the extra 75% yeah, yeah. trying to avoid the 25%? So it's just making sure that you have yourself you know, and your, and your, and your, and your things done decently and in order. So we wanted to, it's <clears throat> funny that some, I remember someone literally telling me, um, I don't, you know, stop, I gotta stop right there. I don't want to make no more money because I don't want to have to pay more taxes. And I'm like, no, don't hinder yourself. Just time. find a way. Here's a side business mm -hmm. that can help offset some of that tax, you know, debt, but don't ever tell yourself, I don't want to make more money because I don't want to have to pay more taxes. You, 
we're not doing that, y'all. We're in the season of overflow. We're yeah. we going to live this thing fully. Yes, and yes. And yourself a good advisor and tax person. So I know. I can show you how to go yes. ahead and balance that out. Important, important. Okay. Um, and when you have a business, a lot of times you might have to pay to have your taxes done correctly. Um, H&R Block may not be able to do the level of what you're trying to do. Is yeah. that true? Or are you just... Yeah, once you start advancing and going yeah. up, uh, the food chain in your in your professional life, then you need to get somebody that can adequately, you know, do your book. Assess, yeah, and assess your. your um, it was mentioned in the video about Airbnb. That's another thing that took off, right, yes. and was doing very well. I know now that a lot of places have now restricted um, Airbnb, so those businesses are not as yeah. they're, um, they're depending on where they are. You know, I remember I talked about that, right? That yeah. Christmas time it might be hot, and then spring it ain't nobody renting your little spot. Now you're upset. Right. So it's just you got to know the business that you are and do the research of the industry that you're a part of. Like we knew with wings, we know our hot season is football season because it's something about football and wings. Right. Um, Wings, pizza and beer. Wings, pizza and beer. Football season. All those industries are up. Yes. Football season. Always. So we knew August till after Super Bowl is going down. Right. And then we learned as we did it, um, March Madness is another big season. Right. And then we found out that, oh, we thought we was getting a break and it's back cracking again. Right. Because it's, it's March Madness. But and then over the years right now, wings are just wings all year long. <laughs> we right. don't really have the seasons. Surprisingly, so our busiest time is the holiday. Um, so that's just something that we wanted to introduce everybody about. So we have another poll. When do you file a 1099? When do you file a 1099? We'll give you a few moments to answer um, that question um, for those that are participating in the poll. Yeah, that's what we did when we were at the uh, convention. You remember we had the Jeopardy. You guys got to look at the, some of the replays. <laughs> you know, we actually had a financial uh, literacy Jeopardy, you know, that we it did. Fun. It it's actually fun. on the, uh, on the, uh, the YouTube uh, yes. and the app. Yes. All right. When you make more than 600. Okay. When do you file it? 99. Okay. All right. Yeah. Don't know. Good question. Okay. That's fair. That's why we're that's here. That's we're doing it. That's why we're doing this. That's our why, so that we are informed, um, so we can make professional, informed, yeah. smart decisions, okay? So, yeah. I think I'm gonna get you guys an agent so you guys are ready for television and radio, so we are gonna take you on the road and- Yeah, go ahead and get an agent and then make sure you negotiate that contract so I can get paid for my time. <laughs> Right, yes. since he's talking about time, right? Yes. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put y'all put y'all out right. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You all look yeah. photogenic enough, you can do it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so we have most of it coming in. So uh, most of our poll is done. So that so the poll is when you make more than six hundred, and then you had a, about thirty percent that said. Um, good question, but they don't know. So you want to go ahead and talk about that thing, the yeah. 1099? So right. the correct answer is when you do make more than $600 a month, it's actually also uh, uh, kind of uh, got a lot of notoriety. Remember when our former governor, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger had mm -hmm. hired the, the nanny? It's yes, the nanny, the, yes. The, the nanny tax. The right. nanny tax. So yes. unfortunately, you know, it was found that they were doing a little bit under the table stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you have to go ahead and report anybody that you're paying out wages to or income could even be babysitting uh, more than six hundred dollars. So you're supposed to get their social security number. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to, you know, send them a ten ninety nine, which is a good thing for you as the payer because now you write that off your income. And guess what? It pops up on their income. So the good thing about it is a lot of people say that I don't want to get no 1099. I don't want to do all kind of stuff. But you don't have to report income that you receive on a 1099 unless you make about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So you can get your 1099s as an individual. Let's say I'm receiving a 1099. I can make it my business. I can do babysitting. I can do Uber. I can do all kind of stuff. And let's just say between all of those I make $10,000 on the side mm -hmm. and that's all the money I make. I don't make any other money. 
you're not required to pay any income tax, you know, on that. So it's only when you say you're making twenty, thirty thousand dollars on your job and you make money with your 1099, then you have to go ahead and file and you have to report that like you would anyway. But the good thing is when you have a 1099, they know that that's your gross. You're not just making that money and you don't have any expenses with that. Let's just say you drive Uber. With the Uber, you have car maintenance. You're putting miles on mm -hmm, your car. Mm -hmm, you're putting mm -hmm. gas in your car. Mm -hmm. You may have a payment, insurance, all that kind of stuff. Those are things that could be, could be, you have to get with your person, tax deductible mm -hmm. off of that income that you make. So with the side business, even if you're doing photography, the camera that you're using, mm -hmm. the, 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 the computer that you're doing, your the different your, apps for your editing, things, your, you editing your resolution, yeah. all kinds of stuff, all those are tax deductible you know, expenses that you can use to offset that income. So you want to make sure that you keep your books. You have to, you have to, you have to. One of the reasons why a lot of people, unfortunately, weren't able to take advantage of the stimulus money that came out in the pandemic because they weren't filing their taxes. Yes. And then just if I can interject here, um, just recently, um, one of our nieces um, was looking to, to apply for something. She needed to apply for something and she needed to show proof of income because she's doing very well in her business. I mean, extremely well. But because the taxes were not filed right, they wrote off everything. Right. To where it looked like she only made about, let's say, six, seven thousand dollars for the year. So you have to be careful what you're how much you're writing off. Like, yeah. don't go right off crazy trying to avoid paying taxes, right? And then you're because trying now, to qualify for something because the banks, when yes. you're self-employed, let me mm -hmm. just get this nugget to you. Yes. Come when on. you're self-employed. The banks or the people that are looking to approve your application, yes. either it's for an apartment, it's for a car, it's for a house, could be for a credit card. Mm -hmm. They are looking at your net yes. when you're employed because they know that the money that you make on the growth side, it took something for you to make that money. Mm -hmm. So you just didn't make it because they just, you know, uh, uh, sent you a check. It cost you something to do it. Like I told you, in the uh, couple of seconds ago, if you're you know working for Uber, then you know your car, your expense, gas. Obviously, you can't go and pick up passengers if you don't have any gas in your car. Right. right. So that is actual expense that you can write off and you can deduct. But you're not going to be able to qualify based on that gross. It's the net because they want to see okay, this is how much money you made. This is how much it took to make that money. These are the expenses. And this is what you have left over. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what they're going to qualify you on. When you work a job, they qualify you on your gross. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. So when you're qualifying for a self-employed person, it's on your net. When you qualify as a um, W-2 employee, it's mm -hmm. on your gross. Mm -hmm. So if you write off everything and you have a negative on your business, then the bank is not going to approve you because you look like you're out of business. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's one thing that was just, um, was discovered. Um, also this is even for people that have, um, brick and mortar places. Right. Um, I know, I don't know if my niece is still on here, but she has her own business, but she has a brick and mortar. So all this applies to that. Cause I think sometimes people think that if I work at home from home, it's different my paperwork, everything is different if I actually have a location, like a brick and mortar. You still got to operate it the same. Even if it's from your home, you want to take it serious. Um, I know we talked about, I think before, talked about um, accounts being set up. Always have your side businesses. Let it have its own account. You will not really understand or grasp how much you're really making if you're combining all your money together. And give your account for that side business a name. Like I literally have the name for my side business is Dazzling Chic. So when I go into the bank and I go to that account, that's my, that's my Dazzling Chic account. I know exactly how much I'm spending because when I'm ordering envelopes for shipping, that's coming out of that account. When I'm restocking on my jewelry and my inventory, that's coming from that account. If I'm adding this and taking the money from, let's say, the Wingstop business, and then people are buying from me jewelry, but it's all going to the wing side. Yeah. How am I going to know how much my business really yeah. made? 
so you and it's commingling, and now you're confused. Yeah, you don't want to get involved in, in, in mixing your personal money with your business money. You definitely don't want to get involved with mixing, you know, one business to the next business. You want to keep every set of books separate yes, and distinct. Yes. So that way, if you're audit or if you need to get some credit, you can just pull up one set of books right. and say, That's hey, right. this is what I've done. This is yes. my, yes. this is a Yannick will love this number, this, this statement. This is my p &L. This is my profit <laughs> right. and loss. This is how much my money is making or this is how much my, my, my business is not making, right? Yes. So you want to do it. So here, these are the things. What should you but do before this your is, business? Because I'm thinking about it just came back to me. Y'all know this is live. We, we ain't playing. This is uncut. Um, remember when you were talking about you just helped our niece when she was setting up, because she kept saying, I have my business and I'm just splitting it up 50-50. And she felt like she couldn't really see what she was making. And then you told her, no, you got to do it like this. You got to have an account for your business to take care of business stuff. Right. Right. Well, I think so that if, if I can... remember correctly, I believe that what she was doing is when she was selling product, mm -hmm. she was receiving uh, the money. And she was basically just putting that money from the net sales into her personal account, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But you still had to go ahead and make purchases to buy your product for the next time. So she was taking money out of her personal account yes. and, 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 and putting it back into product. Instead of what you do is you leave the money in your business account and then you just pay yourself a percentage or mm -hmm. put yourself mm -hmm. on salary. It depends on what level you're at you know, uh, in your personal. So now if you have to make purchases for uh, more product, for labels, for, you know, uh, what envelopes, containers, containers or envelopes or whatever, yeah. then it's out of that business account. And you record that in your profit and loss, because this is the expenses that you chart in your accounts and the money that you put aside for yourself. That's what you could go ahead and pay your personal bills with. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. have low money for vacations. You can have money, you know, set aside for savings or whatever. But whenever you don't set it up that way. Now it seems like you're always dipping into your, your personal, personal money. And that's what she was so frustrated. Business. She was like, I just feel like I'm not making no money. I have to, I needed um, a laptop and for business to print out things, right? And now I had to go into my personal Which account from my nine to five. Left the business and, and, and went into the yes. personal because yeah. it's, just, it's just, it's the same money. But when you, it's the way you think and the way you look at what you're doing mm -hmm. is makes it frustrating because it's not done correctly. And as soon as she was able to just make that yeah, little she, twist that little and that little change, you yeah. know, then everything, it, she started selling more. She started doing, because she started feeling better about yourself. Just a little bit more pep in your step. And you feel like you're I'm, still, I'm at least actually, making money. Instead, right. I'm working this hard. I'm up doing all of these things and it's not yielding me any money because as soon as something happens, I got to go into my personal account that I get from my county job, let's say, yeah, right, uh -huh. to pay for this business. It's not making sense. So I know one way I would tell my team that would talk to me for paparazzi, I was telling them to do it in thirds. Right. Do that, do that money that you're doing in thirds. Pay yourself back for the jewelry that you, you ordered, right? right? And that goes back into the business account. Give some for yourself, and then you have something to do the to business. Reinvest, repurchase to reinvest. More, repurchase right? So you're paying yourself back. Then you need to have some reinvestment money to purchase more product, and then you give yourself whatever you, whatever yeah. you feel you earn. So and QuickBooks is a good good way of uh, yes. being able to do that. Yes. So, yes. so uh, one of the things what is to what do, to do before you start, start your, your own business. Yeah. Yes, you know, this is good. We get money. we get into the close. Yeah. So definitely, we 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 talked about you know the the fine line between when you go full time and quitting your job and everything like that here it says that you need to have at least one year of living expenses saved up and that's in addition to your emergency fund right so you don't say oh i have you know 6 months in my emergency fund so now i just need another 6 months no this is entirely separate have your emergency fund plus your year right you know partner up join forces with somebody do your research, know your numbers. You have to know your numbers. What does it take? We talked about baking and things like that and then have a business strategy. You need to have your budget, your timeline, your target demographic, your marketing plan, your mission statement, your business plan. All those things need to be clear and concise before you start. Yes, yes. So that's on the do the research. Yes. yes. And I was a research. Remember I talked about that. Um, at the beginning, I think our first night about how we got into Wingstop and how I went and would go to the different Wingstop locations to see 
what it looked like, how many people were coming, telling Clint, oh my gosh, the people wait for it to open. Because what the funny thing is, which y'all didn't know, so this is a little, little background, right? Is that when we first got into the Wingstop business, Wingstop didn't even open at four o'clock. Did y'all know that? Yeah. It was only an evening. It was a dinner type of restaurant. Lunch was introduced within that time that we were in the building stage. Yeah. So by the time, it was yeah, actually an the option. Price. They asked the us, do you want to be open for lunch? Because this is something we're launching or do you just want to stick with the 4 p.m. dinner? And we were like, we're all in. We want to get it early, every right? Time uh, every there's time there's opportunity, we want to take it. So that was the thing, doing the research, know your market. You know, you don't want to go selling. Um, this is another business that, that was a franchise. And I think we're going to talk about that in a few slides. But a franchise that opened up and was doing well, I think, in Israel, Egypt, wherever that little hamburger yeah. thing is. Yeah. It came over here and it was a flop. Yeah. They didn't. They just saw that the U.S. is just overindulgence. We're going to put this over there, too. And it didn't work. Yeah. And we had people that I know Clint had clients that he had to help actually pull out of those contracts that they had signed up for because it wasn't a good thing for over here. So it's important that you do the research, okay? All right, six things to do before starting a business. Realize entrepreneurship is a marathon. Come on, it's a marathon, it's a marathon, it is a marathon. We had our first year of being able to go out on Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah, last year. Last year. <laughs> right that yeah. was our very first time that we did well, not physically two years, work two, two years two years physically yeah. work in the, in the store. store on super bowl because we was all in it's after, a marathon it takes time so, takes time yeah. takes time yeah for sure there's a demand for your product or service you know no you know uh uh no you won't get it right the first time so yeah there's things that you have to go ahead and learn as you go right be patient and make sure yes. that you have adequate funding that's a big thing right big thing do big i jump thing. in on that one too no we're just gonna okay. go on it's okay said, these are things. Said, understand <laughs> you know your target audience and it said solve a problem you know and listen to your customers so those are the good things they always the say the best things have been invented by, by solving, by you know, solving uh, a simple problem. thing, right? Yep. You know, toothpick, yeah. you know, because you had something between your teeth. Not toothpick, okay. Yeah. Well, well, what what about, about thought, toothpick, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> if you were the inventor of, of toothpicks, you would be thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've <laughs> so, we been on to something. You know, so, so here's a cute starting a business checklist. Make a plan. Pick a business structure. Um, determine how you'll finance it. Real important because we don't believe in giving all your cash away if you can get finance other people's money, okay? Uh, register your business name, register your business name, register your business name before you go and do an LLC, amen? Because that's a whole nother subject because that's the new thing. Everybody wants well, to get an kinda, LLC. That's kind of part of the-, the Yeah, the but thing. right, so right. Yeah. But, you know, set up your tax accounts, register yes. your business license for your, and your permits, and then get an accounting system. And I saw somebody in the chatting group that, you know, QuickBooks, yes, is a good way to go ahead and keep your, your balance sheet and your P&L and uh, things like that. So that's, that's a good. Um, QuickBooks are good. Um, even now, I do a lot of things for my side business with Square. They give me everything I need. They do all, they have all the reporting and things like that. For, of course, that's not all of accounting, but I'm just yeah. saying um, that's something else that's out there. And we see that, um, Gwen, we will answer that question in a minute. Um, four reason why businesses fail. These are important because these are the times when you get frustrated that you need to hold on, change is on the way, right? 40% yeah. um, of small businesses fail because there's no market for their product or service. Again, find out what the market is just because you like marshmallow pies well, those are kind of popular one time. I don't know, but you know what I mean. Like, make sure that people like it. I did jewelry because I know everybody like jewelry. Don't play with me, right? 14% um, of small businesses fail because they ignore their customers. Even now, 17 years um, of being open, we just celebrated on July, 5th, July 6th. Um, we still listen to customer feedback, right? We still trying to make sure that branch is in that bag. 23%, um, you got to move that because I can't see. 23% of small businesses fail because they don't have the right team. Yeah. That's important. That's important. But first, you got to be a strong leader 
and get yourself together before you start adding a team. Sometimes people grow too fast. They add yeah. teams and assistants. I have never met so many people that have all these assistants and they're not doing nothing. They're not doing nothing. I'm like, girl, if you don't call me so we could talk about this, I've got to go through six or seven people. You're not there yet, but it's okay. And I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you ain't there yet. Um, so take your time even with that. 29% um, of small businesses ran out of cash in their first year of running business. So slow down. Just because you had a line out the door the first Christmas does not mean that next Christmas that's going to happen and it's time for you to expand, especially in the restaurant world. Slow down. I saw businesses expand too early, increase that rent, and then they were out of business. We didn't open our second location for Wingstop until year six. Okay, so we, we made sure we watched that thing. All right, pass, 30 passive income ideas, which is the gig business, rent out of yeah. room, be careful with that. These are just things that we found. We are not back yeah. in any particular so company. Them, so we won't read all of them. Just see, um, you know, the different things. Yes, you know. invest in royalty income, sell products on eBay. Yeah. I got a whole Poshmark site. I'm getting ready to upload some more stuff on there that I'm getting rid of because I believe in getting rid of as you bring in sell products on Amazon, do that research because that comes with yeah. um, event. Mobile car washes are great. Yeah. Just FYI. Just build, um, your clientele. build your clientele. You got to get out there and, and, and work hard. Yeah. I wouldn't be renting out my car. So, you know, tread lightly. But these are just some examples. Um, yeah. Sell print on demand t-shirts. I love a good graphic tee. Yeah. So I'm always That's buying good. graphic tees. You can, you can go to the next one. Yes. And franchising. Yeah. Ding, 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 this, ding, is ding, another, ding, this is another video. Short video, just talking about that. And we'll kind of get ready to wrap it up after that. A franchise is a business in which one party, the franchisee, acquires access to the proprietary knowledge, processes, and trademarks of an established business, the franchisor. A franchise offers the chance to own a business while avoiding many of the initial challenges. The franchisee buys the right to sell a product or service under an established brand name. The market already knows the brand, so there's no need to spend extra resources introducing the product. Franchises are a popular way to start a business, especially a fast food business like Subway, Dairy Queen, or McDonald's. Examples from other industries include UPS, Allstate, Econa Lodge, Merry Maids, and more. Franchises offer the advantages of buying a well-known brand and a proven business system to follow. The franchisor provides support, and prices for inventory and equipment are typically lower than starting up a business alone. Franchises typically have to share financial information and conform to uniform procedures, which aren't always popular. Startup costs and annual licensing fees can be expensive, and the franchisee is reliant upon the support of the franchisor. One of the things that I love to, to share also, we consider a franchise more of a business in a box, mm -hmm. right? Dee and I don't have a food uh, uh, or cooking background, right? right. I mean, we're foodies. That's how we, we found uh, Wingstop as well as our other loves, you know, Fat Burger, Handles. We were always customers first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So here's, you know, types. But one of the things that people think about franchises, they only think about the food industry, right? right. But there's right. so many different things. Like, look, Planet Fitness, is, is a franchise. Remax, being a realtor, you can actually have that as a franchise. You talked about H&R Block mm -hmm. is a different franchise. UPS Store is a franchise. Ace Hardware, right? Supercuts, if you know how to cut hair, 
you know, that's uh, or petition. That's a, a franchise. So oh, someone here mentioned Starbucks. Unfortunately, Starbucks is not, not franchise. a franchise. They, I, if they did, I promise y'all, we would have a Starbucks. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> your girl would own a Starbucks right now if they franchise. Those are all corporate. I would sell all of the things to have a Starbucks, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Starbucks is not um, a franchise. So those are more your corporate stores, yeah. right? Um, but there are other industries that are right. franchises that you probably didn't know. Um, so let's do so, this yes. real quick. Let's go back like the two slides uh, because they want to screenshot those different types of, of uh, businesses, yes. businesses yes. for ideas. No, back. Go one forward. more, one more. Go back. Yeah, one more. There, there you, go. you go. So I know someone in the chat, we see you, Madam Bishop. So if you want to take a picture of this, feel free to do that um, right now. And then we will um, go forward. But a franchise, um, again, these are some of the things that we hear about franchising. Yeah. It, is it really, do, are you, well, we get the question, does that be considered a Black-owned business? Listen, yes, you are responsible for the things that are happening yeah. in your restaurant yeah. or your cleaners or whatever it is that you do. Even as a franchisee, you are still a business So owner. you paid them a licensee fee or a royalty in order to use their name and to their brand knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to the recipes of a fat burger, the recipes of a wing stop, you know, the recipes of a handles. It's already when you sign, you sign the disclaimer, you sign your NDA that you are going to protect the brand and the recipes and the what they call the proprietary, mm -hmm. you know, information, mm -hmm. you know, like it's your own, you know, so that way you don't have what they have but, uh, in coming to America. Yeah, McDonald's, McDonald's versus McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> You know? Right. So, or, you know, cleaning these wings and wing side. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's the, the benefit. And it's a proven record. Yeah. Uh, most of the time they can say this is what we've done. This is where we've opened. This is the demographic. This is the market. And if you do these things that we've done, you will have this level of success. Now, of course, there is no guarantee. Yeah, and they let you know that in that agreement. But it's there. And it also helps you with advertising, right? I don't have to go and figure out training videos because we have a corporate that does all the behind the scenes stuff for us. When it comes to commercials, um, especially on the Wingstop level, they had national commercials. All we had to do was tap into them and get they can get them to us and then we can have them ran in our local store right. market right. area. Right. So franchise was great for us. I do understand that some people have thriving businesses that are not franchises. Example, Clint's Godbrother, who is JC, they own the Serving Spoon, right? Um, and that has been a family business and well, now a, a landmark in the Inglewood area that is doing well and it's a restaurant, right? But again, we went the franchise route because we were not, we didn't have that food background. So another thing that comes with franchising is training. Yeah. They give you the training. Um, I see um, our, our fat burger mother, right, is on here, Mary McGill. She is like the lady of fat burger. Yeah. And let me tell you something. She's the queen of fat burger. She is the queen. She is the queen. Whether they give her that title or not, I just gave it to her. But the training that we got from her, right, she was there with us side by side, taking us through everything. It's a, it's a method to wrapping that burger in that package, right? Um, so everything has an order. And we like that because we want somebody to come and show us how to do it versus going in there and messing up a recipe and saying that don't taste good. Throw that out. I, I didn't want to do all that. Um, so franchising is great opportunities for those that want to do it. But we will say this, even in a franchise, be prepared to work your business. It's owner operator. If that ain't what you're trying to do, we get Clint gets calls all the time about people that have, I got this extra money and I just want to invest and I'm going to open up this French fry place, right? right? Had no intentions of ever working in there. That's almost headed for disaster. You're probably going to be out of business within a year or so and that's the doing why that. We had yeah. that poll because yes. that's what a lot of people do. They think that when you open up a franchise or when you open up a business that you can basically get this thing, invest technically sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars yes. and then yes. turn your key over to a stranger or even worse, a family member and oh. think that they're going to <laughs> run it as well as you. They don't have any skin in the game. That We've already talked 
about this, right? You have to have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So they don't have anything to lose. So when times get tough, in which they will, you know, then they're just out. Or some get disgruntled, they're mm -hmm. out. You yeah. have to go ahead and know how to operate your business. And to be honest with you, I say that nobody in that business should know it better than you. Nobody. I you am know? the wean queen, period. That's okay. It. That's it. They should That's not it. know how to do it better than you. Yes. Now you shouldn't want to or have to do it forever because I'm not going to be a slave to the business. Mm -hmm. But in times of, 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 necessity. of necessity, we ready to get back in there and work yeah. and, and make it happen. On, I will put on a fat burger t-shirt and then a wing stop button up just in case I got to switch. That's how we yes. do it, right? Because you got You should know your business better than everyone else. You train people that will work as efficient as you, but you should know your business better than everyone else. I love this, that what Dewana just posted, she said the, the farmer's shadow it went away. What happened? The farmer's crop grows by his own shadow, right? Yeah, you great. gotta be yeah. in it. You yeah. gotta be in it. Even, especially if you have your own business, that is not the time to open up your own business and then just say, I don't have to do anything because I opened up my business. Be in it, y'all. That's the best yeah. advice we can give you yeah, is yeah. know it and, and work it. Somebody that is going to love it and be passionate about it is you. And you can identify those people. That's, they don't have right. to be an owner. They can be a quality, solid employee. Yes. But I'm telling you, if you don't get invested in your business and your vision, you are not going to be able to win. Yes. I'm just telling you. Now, without you being there, you know, 24-7. So you have to be a good leader. And, and you're going to have to follow in order to be a good leader mm -hmm. and treat people correctly, right? Yes. So these are some uh, good resources for you to learn about franchising, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the Franchise Times is a magazine that we subscribe to, and it covers all different types, whether it's the food industry, fitness cleaners, industry, yes. cleaners or whatever, who's um, uh, coming up for sale, what trends, what market, and, it, and it's a free resource, right? Mm -hmm. It's just FranchiseTimes.com. And you can learn whatever you want to learn about the franchise business. And one also is the American uh, Association of Franchise Dealers, uh, which is a uh, 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 organization uh, designed to help franchise owners basically be uh, better prepared. It's, you know, like an association, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we can have a meeting of the minds. There's different things that's come up. I mean, there was legislation just recently that actually didn't go forward today that we were on a call with uh, that was at uh, Capitol Hill in uh, Sacramento uh, about uh, the minimum wage and uh, hours that people should be able to work and all that kind of stuff. So these are things that you will need to know that's going to affect you, mm -hmm. uh, that you want to go ahead and be uh, in concert with others. Yes. Right. Yes. So okay. this is uh, good resources for you to, to have. Mm -hmm. And it's just good to, to, to venture and, and find out about to learn, it. Yep. Right. And look at the various business models that you could yes. do. What yes. laundromats, right. Parking lots, vending machines, you know, self-serve uh, car washes, storage facility. All these are different you know, avenues that you can open up a business. And the funny thing is, to be honest with you, almost every single one of these has a quote unquote franchise model. And the reason why we keep saying franchise is our route. But me as a, a financial advisor, I consult clients from all different walks of life. And the majority of them do not own franchises. Just let That's me right. tell you that. We know all of them. You from know, the salad people to the <laughs> All of them, right? I said, I got, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. The so I had curves. Hundreds curves. of years. You know? <laughs> so the thing is, it's a good model that you can learn. And if you want to branch out and do something on your own after that, I think it's a good way where you can get introduced to mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. without having all that back office headache. You're still going to have to have money. You're still going to have to put in the work. You're still yes. going to put in the time, but at least you don't have to figure out, you know, how to, you know, set up your books, set up your accounting, mm -hmm. you know, train people, even your your menu, your business card, your logo, right? right I mean, right. you you have to, when you're self-employed and you're just doing everything on your own, you, you have to that. figure out how to create your logo, your yeah. website, right? Yeah. Now your app. You know, are you gonna have an app? You know, what's my menu prices should be? What's this? See, all that kind of stuff. I would like to just pay somebody and get them to take care of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. some people don't like it. They don't want to do royalties. I know people that even sold their wing stop because they wanted to go ahead and do their own restaurant because they didn't want to pay the royalties and things like that. You know, I don't have a problem with paying royalties because I know how to get people to work 
in order for what I'm paying them. And I know the value of what I'm paying them. So when I call corporate and I say, hey, I need something, I expect it to be there because I pay good royalties, right? And that's what the contract, see the contract is, is uh, reciprocal. That means I do something, you do something. You do something, I do something. Mm -hmm. It's not just one way. You take my money and I don't hear from mm -hmm. you anymore, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one of the things that you have to look at. How are you going to be able to navigate through this? Mm -hmm. Look at this. You know, oh, they even have like CPA firms, and accounting firms, yes. because that's that's a, a model in which in the tax profession, right? Document shredding, a, ATM. Yeah, a, a client that was looking at doing. Um, yeah, uh, oil. Uh, oil uh, changing. Like a jiffy lube type of thing. Tire. No, they was no, tire. Oil oh, it was oil, 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 oil change. Yeah. Like, like a jiffy lube. You know, it wasn't jiffy lube, but it was something similar to that. That was a franchise model that they wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, look at this, see, porta potties. People don't think about that. They look at it as nasty, but there's money in porta potties. And you just saw, <laughs> you just saw a luxury. The luxury. luxury don't tell me about the next party I have. I'm having a luxury porta potties, okay? They yeah. got luxury kind. And which, that was a business <laughs> model. They were saying, hey, you can go ahead and get into it and, yeah. and rent yeah. them out and pull them up at your yeah. next low event. Yeah. And uh, now it, it's like a trailer. It's right. not even, it doesn't look like that. No, it's, not at it, all. It looks like- You're walking up on the steps, they got lights and everything in there. Vanities for you. and everything Van like that. Come on, vanities. So, I mean, but, it's everything. But these are just some, again, just to give you an idea, um, look, uh, we who, get the calls the all the time. You know, selling ice and shave ice. They do that in Bakersfield this time of year all the time. What, shave ice? Shave ice stations are huge in the city of Bakersfield. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you- I mean, there's so many different things that you can do to, to make additional income. So what we're doing here is we're just trying to open up your thinking. To ML, get we you, talked about MLMs. We talked about just your own business, Baker, Baker. Um, photographer. Um, Anthony is on there, Pastor Anthony. I know he does photography. So we talk about all that. Yeah. Um, Realtors, insurance. Insurance. People. We talked about Airbnb. So we've covered a lot of information. We hope that it has been great for you. We have the final poll for the night and then we're gonna open up if someone has Thanks quick questions um, and then we'll say good night until for next time. All right, so is a franchise a business? Now we just talked about the thing. Everybody better had a right answer for this. One. But if you don't, there is no bad question, okay? There's no bad question. Is a franchise a business? And will you consider yourself your uh, a small business, a small owner. business yeah, owner? A yes. Yeah. For the people in the back that say, if you have a franchise, you ain't really the owner. Who said that? I know how much money I spent to open it up. Put your questions in the chat, please, if you have any. Um, and then we will cover that. Before you do that, let's get out of the poll. All right. It looks like everybody understands that a franchise is definitely a business. Close it there. Here we go. All right. Yes. So. Babe, go up to the questions part before you go to that. Okay, it was one up here earlier. Do, 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 do. While we're doing that, there is how to contact us. Yes, we wrote a little book. It's actually a good book. Um, okay, there yeah. we go. What is the time frame of opening a franchise? It depends. I would honestly say anywhere from. But it depends. I mean, it, it we, depends. Got in, we got involved yeah. with Handles two years ago. Yeah. And we're not open yet. Because a lot of times finding your location becomes the biggest hurdle, hurdle is finding um, your location. Um, the initial cost of a franchise, it varies depending on what type of franchise so this it is. is. The thing. So yeah. a lot of times people don't understand in the, in the cost of franchising. There's a uh, uh, franchise fee that they see that's normally a reasonable number, right? $50,000, $35,000, mm -hmm. $40,000, mm -hmm. it might be $25,000, depending on what yeah. the franchise is. Yeah. And they think, okay, I'm going to open up a Wingstop for $50,000 yes. or $50,000. Right. But what you don't understand is that's what you're getting to them. Just to be able to say that you're involved with Wingstop and you can use their name, you can license their name. But then you have to find your location, right? Just like anything, when you get an apartment, you have to, you know, pay your first and your last and your security deposit and mm -hmm. everything like that mm -hmm. for a location. So that's going to cost mm -hmm. you some money, right? Yes. You know, depending on where you go. I mean, from Rodeo Drive to, you know, some some place in the in the Crenshaw. desert. 
right? Print off different <laughs> price points, right? So it just depends, right? Yeah. Then, you know, you also have to say, okay, what is it that going to cost me in order to make this my McDonald's, right? right? So we've converted, you know, uh, uh, a GNC, mm -hmm. we've converted dental, a dental uh, place, yeah. we converted a florist, mm -hmm. you know, and we've converted an insurance office, yes. you know, into a restaurant. So those are going to have different costs of construction in order to make it look mm -hmm. like you know, it's going to be your store, your yeah. fat burger, right. your wing stop, right? So, you know, that could range anywhere between, you know, 100000 to a few hundred thousand dollars, mm -hmm. depending on how much depending construction how much construct, you yeah. have. Then guess what? You have to buy all the tables, the chairs, the utensils, mm -hmm. the pots, the pans, you know, everything that you can think about, the napkins that you're giving away, the, the straws, the spoons, everything like that. So that has a cost to it. That's your consider your small wares. Mm -hmm. Then you have to get all your big equipment mm -hmm. from your fryers to your grills to your ice cream machines to your refrigeration cabinets and all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff. So that can cost, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So when you're looking at all of that, now you're talking about maybe in order to open up your quote unquote wing stop, you may be at a total price five, six, seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I mean, your average quote unquote you know, a uh, place that is based on maybe, you know, 1,500 square feet is going to cost you probably about $300 on average a square foot. Mm -hmm. So if it's 1,500 square feet times 300, that's 450,000 bucks. Yeah. You know, so that's good. If you're, if you're building out a space that's 2,000 square feet, mm -hmm. it's probably going to cost you about 600,000 bucks. Yeah. So that's a good way that you can kind of, you know, judge it, you know, but that's where people kind of get in their mind a little bit, uh, um, uh, preconceived information that okay i can open up this and it only costs fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars well and then it's, well, that's sorry. just basically to start that's just the entry level yeah. then you have to figure out what's going to take to open right which is why we always say um getting your finance house in order right getting your money saved up making sure your credit is good because even if you have like we met a person that opened up a wing stop the same time we did that i was in training with that took all of his retirement money to open up the wing stop. And then he didn't, it didn't last. I think within five years, he was closed. Um, he was out of business. Now you've taken all of your money from your retirement, poured into the business, and now the business doesn't survive. So that's why we say get your credit right so that you can finance. A lot of people say, I got all this money, I wanna just invest it. Slow down. Because you want to have some money saved up and you want to have access to something. So if anything goes down, you have that money to fall back on and get the financing when applicable. Um, oh, yes, Crenshaw does cost now. So let me not sleep on Crenshaw. But y'all know what I mean, right? Y'all know what I mean. I love Crenshaw, right? Business credit, yeah, absolutely. Business so, credit. You know, one um, of the things that people... Oh, that's a good question. What is the max to write off for startup costs? So technically, your startup cost has to be amortized. Mm -hmm. So you can't just write it off anymore. Yeah, this yeah. changed. So you have to amortize that over uh, a number of years. I believe it's seventeen years. So mm -hmm. if it costs you a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, you can't just say, "Okay, I'm going to take a two hundred thousand dollar write off." You know, this year. Mm -hmm. No, it has to be amortized over over yes. time. Yes. You know, yes. for startup costs. Oh, I think is that a hand? Oh no, that was a <laughs> that was a curse of child. <laughs> All right. So I think we're time. We're okay. We got about two minutes. Um, this has been a great night. Thank you all for joining. The commitment is there. I know we had a couple slides that show so remember if you would like those, to support. Yeah. For um, all those real quick yes. station invitations for all those that have come late. We're not going to be meeting next week. Yes. There's a prior commitment that we have to do for the Pentecost Assemblies of the World, the national you know, convention. national convention that's on the, uh, that start on the 16th. So the 18th is going to be postponed to the following week. So that way there's no conflict because we know that people are, you know, participating with that as part of our audience. So we don't want to, we don't want to conflict. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're postponing it one week, which Yannick, see, that's what I'm see, talking about. See, I, 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 she I, on I it. It. <laughs> it's already up and it's posted. The next one live is going to be the 25th. And that's please, please, please. I have some special information I would love to present to you guys on stewardship and tithing. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. So it's important. We're trying to build the kingdom of God with our resources and our time, which uh, and our talents. 
-hmm. and, and stewardship and tithing is uh, essential for you to do well, yes. I believe. Yes. Right. So I think we covered all the questions. Um, I know uh, before, we had before you guys, before you guys um, move on, I just want to say um, the information that you all have presented, not just tonight, but the last five sessions or four sessions that we have, <clears throat> I was sharing this with Didi. I think the people that have been coming are greatly going to benefit. And in the next probably year to two, we're going to see more entrepreneurship yeah. within our council, within our local churches. We're going to see an increase in people being able to support our churches. And when you, when you go over the stewardship part, they're going to be able to say like, okay, I'm making more, so I'm going to support more. Um, and I think it's going to be because of what you all have covered I think you guys are going to birth out quite a few business owners, quite a few entrepreneurs, yeah. and we're going, to, we're going to benefit from it as a body. Yes. So thank yes. you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. This has been awesome. We have so, one final question. Should every business have an LLC? So uh, you should have a structure. Yes. You know, whether it's an LLC, an S Corp or a uh, C Corp, that depends on what it is that you're doing and where you're at in that business. So you need to really consult an advisor. The good thing is when you do a, a franchise, they are going to require you to have a structure. They're not going to basically uh, uh, have you set up as what we call a sole proprietor. So mm -hmm. you're going to you know, have to get a structure. So once you start seeing what your revenue is, what your sales and how you do it, then they'll be able to uh, uh, set it up with the advice of your tax person. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse, oh, me. Bless you. Excuse me. So you'll be able to set that up with your tax professional and your uh, financial advisor to make sure what structure is uh, proper for you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not a one-all be-all uh, answer, unfortunately. I can't do that for you. Yeah, this, every, every case is, is done separately. Um, when opening a franchise, can there be multiple investors? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I would yeah. definitely with your partnership agreement or your operating agreement, I would differentiate what roles that each, each person, person is going to have, what right? Percentage role they're playing, um, all of that. Have that already figured out before you go into business um, so that it's very clear that you said that this is what you want to do. This person only wants to just invest their money. They don't want to have anything to do with the other part of it. That's all understood because we have, um, mentored um, people that have gone in together and done that. And then it, it just felt the operation of the business fell it's, on one person. It's a marriage. Um, it's, it's a marriage. It's a marriage. It's a marriage. And when so you, yeah, you need to yeah. make sure that you uh, can get along one yes. another and you also can communicate well. Effectively. Effectively, you know, so that way you know that, okay, I'm going to do this. You're going to do that. And, you know, there's, there's a, plethora of things that you need to do in order to run a successful small business mm -hmm. so some skill sets are not just in one person right yeah. you need to have multiple you know talents and they can run successfully but everybody and then sometimes which is uh, a case different seasons for the business right mm -hmm. your talents may be needed and utilized in this time so you may yeah. be doing a a a, a bulk, uh, uh, what they call the bulk mm -hmm. of the work for this period of time. Then some other time, somebody that has an accounting or administration background is going to have to do this mm -hmm. in this season. Let's say you get audited, right? Then their <laughs> talents are going to are going to show up. Yeah. So yeah. it's something that, hey, we're going to lean on you when I can, you know, use your talents. You're going to lean on me when I use my talents. But we're going to do this together, and problem. those roles are defined, right? Mm -hmm. And once you kind of do that, and you do that over time then uh, you can be successful, but you definitely need to have that communication, you know, from the start, yes. because if you do it after the fact, people are going to feel a little, uh, what they call it, uh, resentful, because yeah. they feel, oh, I'm doing everything, and you're doing nothing. Well, no, I mean, we used to have employees that say that all the time. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, did, I did everything Ms. today. Ms. D, I, I, I was the only one working today. I said, now you, what you do? And we got all these tickets that were done. <laughs> you didn't do all that by yourself. You know, that's their favorite line. Let's see, I did everything. They wasn't doing nothing. I was like, you okay. Got six other people there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, let's have a but, conversation about it. But uh, those are just the things that, you know, our experiences that hopefully that have helped you. Uh, there's always room, but we wanted to set this up, you know, strictly 
and uh, really uh, sincerely just to get your thinking uh, and the way you think about money, the way you think about business and the way you just think about yourself personally in life and your financial literacy. Uh, because if you know better, you can do better. That's and right. that's really all we're trying to do. This is not a uh, you know, solicitation for anything. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, I'll help, but I'm not you know, saying call me and then I can be your financial advisor. You know, so you know, this is just for you to be able to ask yourself the questions that we've posed and hopefully uh, you'll be able to, uh, to uh, you know, shed some light on what moves and motivates you, yes. right? So go back, watch all the videos. We have, this will now be video number five. Yeah. We'll probably be up and available tomorrow. So if you came on late, go ahead and take a look at it on YouTube, um, share it. You can share it, it's free. You can tell others um, to, to take a look at it, especially yeah. if it's somebody that owe you some money, go back and show them the video, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, yes, some literacy. Yes. So this one may not be up just yet, uh, but the other ones are. Uh, so just give us a week or so uh, and this one will be up. But there yes, is. And Pastor Anthony has just put in the link. So get that copy real quick um, before we say good night. God bless you all. May you be blessed in Jesus. Um, thank you for, for hanging out with us. We went a little bit over tonight, but I knew this was going to be a, a a hefty topic. Yeah, anytime you talk about um, money, people want to know how to get it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Gwendolyn, for being on here tonight. Yeah, great, um, great questions. Great questions, great questions. Yeah, thank you. All right, I think that, oh, there we go. That's the last minute. All right. All thank right, you guys. God bless you guys. Have See an amazing ya. week. See y'all on July the 25th. Yeah. God bless. Bye. Love y'all. <laughs> Bye.